A few years ago, Wale Shoinka published a book titled Of Africa. In it, he laments what he calls the fictionalization of Africa. For to fictionalize is to create an Africa that does not in reality exist. And so another scholar from Ghana, Kwame Apia, in the early 90s, he published a book titled In My Father's House. The suggestion of Kwame Apia was the following, that Africa is like a house with many rooms and that there are more than one way of being African and that there are many, many experiences of being African. Even colonialism was not experienced in exactly the same way by all Africans in every corner of Africa. And Kwame Apia said no to this homogenization of Africa, this reduction of Africa into one single gray entity. For his part, Shoinka argues that when people say the dark continent, referring to Africa, he says when they say that, it's not really a reflection on Africa. Rather, the darkness that was so readily attributed to the dark continent, says Shoinka, may yet prove to be nothing but the willful cataract in the eye of the beholder. In Berlin in 1884, when the European powers of the day met to cut up Africa and decide that this line will be the division between Burundi and Burkina Faso, this line will be the division between Rhodesia and South Africa, and on and on they went with not a single African in the room. And Choinka argues that until today, we are a fiction in the eyes of many, but what is worse, we have become a fiction to our own selves. We live in a fictional space. This is in part because Africans have themselves yet to fully confront the impact and the havoc of Berlin 1884. So when you see Zimbabweans crossing the border to come to South Africa today, or Mozambicans doing the same, or Ghanaians crossing the border into Nigeria, and Ugandans crossing the border into Rwanda and vice versa. But what we don't realize is that Africans have been doing this for hundreds of years, except that 200 years ago, there was no border. They walked to and fro without being criminalized. In the African diaspora, County Cullen, in his poem Heritage, posed the question in the most painful way, what is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea? Jungle star or jungle track? Strong bronze men or regal black? Women from whose loins I sprang? when the birds of Eden sang, one, three centuries removed. Agonizing about being African in a country that was not African. About being African and being American at the same time. The same problem was expressed by W.E.B. Du Bois, who spoke about a two-ness inside of him. He says, I'm an American, I'm a Negro. Two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings in one dark body. This schizophrenia of which Dubois speaks, this schizophrenia of which Count Cullen speaks, is not limited to Africans overseas. We suffer the same schizophrenia ourselves. Pius Aden Sami, in his book titled You Are Not a Country Africa, inspired by a poem written by a Sierra Leonean poet, Abiose Nicole, titled The Meaning of Africa. You are not a country Africa. You are a concept fashioned in our minds, each to each, to hide our separate fears, to dream our separate dreams. Only those within you 
who know their circumscribed plot and till it well with steady plough can from the harvest then look up to the vast blue inside of the enameled bowl of sky which covers you and say, you are mine. In 2019, it is 215 years since the first black republic in the world was established. That was when a slave called Twisant Louverture and another one called Jean-Jacques Desalines led a revolution in a country called Saint-Dominique rebelling against the French slave masters and establishing the country that today we call Haiti. 62 years ago, on the 6th of March 1957, Kwame Nkrumah led Ghana to independence. And on that day, he said many words, including that Ghana is free forever, including that our independence is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of Africa. 62 years ago, he said this. In 1963, 32 African countries established the OAU. So the battle against the fictionalization, the battle against the generalization is an old one. It goes back to the scholars and the philosophers of the negritude. It goes back to Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois. It goes back to the kingdoms and kingdoms of Africa itself. There is more to the history of Africa than just the slave trade. There is more to the history of Africa than just Berlin 1884. There is more to the history of Africa than the colonial adventures of the Portuguese, the Dutch, the German, the French, and the British on the continent. Even though we now use English and Portuguese and French and, and all the languages we have gotten from our colonizers to discriminate against one another. So if you don't speak good English, we can tell you are from the DRC. Si tu ne parles pas le français bon, tu n'es pas un vrai Congolais. You are not a true Congolese because you are not speaking proper French. And this is the problem, that we have accepted definitions of who we are that have been handed to us by the very people who have made us a fiction, who have made us a problem. One of the famous essays of Kenyan writer Binya Vanga Wainana, who wrote a satirical essay titled how to write about Africa. It was satire. So he's giving advice to people in Europe who want to write about Africa. He says, in your text, treat Africa as if it were one country. Write about it as if it was hot and dusty with rolling grasslands and huge herds of animals and tall, thin people who are starving. He says, Write about it as if it is hot and steamy with very short people who eat other people. He says, don't get bogged down with precise description. Africa is big. 54 countries, 900 million people who are too busy starving and dying and warring and emigrating to read your book. So don't go into details. The continent, he says, is full of deserts of jungles, of highlands, of savannas, and many other things. But your reader doesn't care about all that. So keep your descriptions romantic and evocative and unparticular. In this biting satirical essay, what Wainana is doing is to present us with several familiar pictures of Africa, like they were taken straight from Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. Some of the descriptions Wainana presents of Africa, the pictures he draws, could have been taken from current Blixens out of Africa. Even when you listen to Salif Keita's Africa, which I love to dance to, but if you listen to the words, it is an Africa of great food, but it's not really an Africa of thinkers. 
Binyavanga Wainana makes fun of all of the above. He says, these are cliches. The African reputation is something we ought to guard with everything we have. So we hear this is the 21st century, the goods are traveling from one country to another, the credit card works, whether you are in Djibouti or you are in New York, but the African person will find it hard to travel as fast as their credit card will travel. African goods will find it hard to cross borders. Where still, African ideas struggle to cross borders. They are neither valued highly nor allowed easy passage in many global borders. There is a photographer called Johnny Miller and I would like to recommend that all of you try and see some of the pictures that he takes. He calls these pictures unequal spaces. So he's got this beautiful picture of Kaya Sands in Johannesburg and Blobos Rand. So Kaya Sands is a squatter camp where the houses look like they are about to fall. And just across the road, there is Blobos Rand, which is a beautiful suburb, top notch. You look at it, you can see, and it gives you this picture of uh, wealth and poverty side by side. Now, you know, when you have inequality that is very high in a country, what is happening really is that the rich are eating the poor and the poor are eating the poor. We can't sustain this as a continent. Again, if you go to Nairobi, go to Kibera, then we have the, ch the, the challenge of violence. And when I talk about violence, I'm talking about the violence before the violence, the violence during the violence, and the violence after the violence. Not just the violence when there is blood on the floor. And when I talk about the failure of leadership, I'm not just talking about political leadership. In fact, I'm bored with political leadership. I'm talking about the leadership of universities. I'm talking about the leadership of churches. I'm talking about the leadership of stock firms. I'm talking about the leadership of the private sector. There is a failure of leadership that we need to arrest. And all of these sectors that I'm talking about sometimes stand in a corner, fold their arms and wait for political leaders who in fact half the time are only interested in their own stomachs. One of the problems that we have now is that we no longer are able to connect the struggle of the poor with the struggle of the earth, the struggle of women with the struggle of the lakes and the seas, the struggle of black peoples in the world, with the struggles of uh, the environment. We, we still continue to talk about these struggles in separate terms and not combine them. Often when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, we talk about it as if it is something that is going to happen to us. It's not something that we will drive. So it comes at you. You don't drive it. You can't change it. It comes packaged already. And that is a problem about which I would have liked to say a little more if I had more time. And finally, the challenge of nihilism, of spiritual bankruptcy and moral bankruptcy. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed coming here.